This program is the latest in the series uh, of programs on building a creative economy in Southern Illinois. A big part of doing that is having the digital infrastructure needed to help creative people and creative economy workers do their jobs. Much of that has already been done in, uh, in, in the region. Uh, in Southern Illinois, there has been uh, an effort to expand broadband access. Uh, Carbondale has been designated a gigabit city uh, and is installing a massive internet pipe throughout our community. So uh, it's not as if we're starting from square one, but how do we use this new capacity? How can we make it more available to more people? How can businesses innovate to use it? And how do we overcome the digital divides that create haves and have nots? Well, here to discuss uh, all that with us is someone who is uh, no stranger to SIU. Uh, Mike Brown holds an MBA in marketing from SIU. Uh, he is currently founder of the BrainZooming Group, a Kansas City-based strategy firm focused on creative, successful, collaborative strategy and strategic planning. Uh, he's familiar with Google's project there in Kansas City and is working on ways that it can be used uh, in that community. We thought that his experience there and his background, as well as his time here spent uh, in Carbondale, would be a perfect guest to come talk about how uh, we best can use these resources uh, in our community. So Mike, welcome back to SIU. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Well, how are y'all doing? Oh, my gosh. Carbondale, I haven't been here for so long. How are y'all doing today? Very, OK, very nice, very good. Well, I'm, I'm so excited to be back and talk to you about some of the things I've done since I was at SIU. I was going to start with a picture of my time here at SIU, but it was so long ago. Photography had not been invented yet, so there was actually no pictures. But uh, after I got my MBA here, I went on and worked for most of my time at a company called Yellow Transportation, ultimately YRC Worldwide, in transportation and logistics, which may seem an interesting profession for somebody to come back and talk about creativity, but it was a really interesting place to be in that we worked with businesses throughout the entire economy. We had to think about what their challenges were, what was going on with them, and it was just a, almost like a second or third MBA coming out of uh, SIU, and a great opportunity as well to do creativity and innovation in a, in a very traditional kind of environment and, and really appreciated what I was able to do there and took a lot of what we developed in strategy and planning and ways to help people be a lot more maybe creative than they even thought they could be in talking about and thinking about their business and took that and started the brainstorming group uh, about five and a half years ago to, to take those type of tools and techniques to really help move conversations along, visions for communities or organizations, move those along very quickly. And I could spend time trying to explain exactly what you, we do. You'll have a, a little bit of a sense of it throughout the presentation, but I sum it up with people a lot of times to say, we produce strategic conversations. And I don't know if you all have been in the same meetings I have. There have been a lot of meetings where you walk out and go, well, that was an interesting conversation, or that was a pointless conversation, or that was a rather boring conversation. The point of a strategic conversation is we try and make sure that it's going someplace. It, it's actionable, it's implementable, and it actually drives to results. And, and we've been very fortunate to do that across a variety of industries, which is what I wanted to do when I left one industry after quite a bit of time, is to, to see how this could work in other places. So in, in prof, for-profits, non-profits, education, communities have been able to, uh, to apply those things. And we'll talk a little bit about that today. This title, Envisioning the Gigabit City, Collaborative and Creative Power of Diversity. When I, when I actually looked at that title after we were done with it, it was just like, whoa, that is a title by committee. That, you can tell everybody sort of had their hands in that, and can we, hopefully it will be an a, a edifying experience, but really want to build on a lot of the work that's already been done, and, and David referenced in, in Shiloh's report, but looking about Carbondale and Southern Illinois, how do you create a creative economy or maybe a more creative economy and, and how does the creative class and, and how does creativity as a place factor into everything? And there's a lot of concepts there, a lot of big concepts, but it's, it's definitely a very important thing to think about. This stat from the uh, London School of Economics, you know, and I think this was probably a creative person came up with this particular stat, that the impact of a creative person is the same as a scientist. You know, is it? I'm sure there was a study behind it, but it says that 
how you bring creative people and a creative sensibility to a place is an important factor and, and something that quite actively, honestly, there's a lot of activity on. This, this study just came out, well, I should say, yeah, you can see that. I was checking before if you could see these slides all the way in the back, but this study last week, no, you can't. I'll show you where you can get them later. It's, I'll, I'll try and point out some of the key things. So uh, looking at creative cities around and creative communities around the US, and Kansas City happened to rank 10th. So when people say, well, what happened is faster internet came into Kansas City, and is it all just sort of buzz? Well, some of it is just buzz, but part of it puts communities on lists like that that, quite honestly, I don't think Kansas City would have been on six or seven or 10 years ago. What it also says is there's a jungle out there of communities really seeing this opportunity of how does creative and business and high-speed internet come together to really set us apart. And I'm, I'm familiar myself with some of that creative struggle as well, because uh, I had to go through that a few years ago to actually make it onto the cover of the Fast Company 100 Most Creative People in Business. And I usually, I hate to sort of blow my own horn at the, at the start of a presentation, but I was very proud to make the cover, and, and you may look at that and say, well, Mike, that doesn't look so much like you unless you maybe changed over the last couple of years. You have to, and this is for my friend who can't, you have to look to, right down in the corner. It's, <laughs> someone said I may have been the only one that got my name on that cover. I don't know, but anyway. So, good, the laugh. So, I've taken most of the visual gags out of this since this is supposed to be a little bit more serious, but, but hopefully we'll have fun and, uh, um, you know, we'll do questions and answers and give everybody a chance to talk. But ideally, what I want to talk more today about is, is not so much the bigger concepts of, of creativity and economy and how that happens, but really down more at a micro level of some of the lessons that I think we brought to the scene in Kansas City and, and, and other communities, but also lessons learned as well over the last few years about how do these things play together. Because it's not just creativity, it's not just business, it's not just internet. They're all ingredients in the right kind of community, the right kind of community that develops economically and culturally and socially and educationally. We're going to look at five different lessons. Uh, the first one we're going to talk about is appreciating different types of perspectives if you're going to have a successful and vibrant creative economy. And, and I'll actually tell a little bit of a story on myself about, in keeping with the theme of being micro, a very micro story about some of the challenges of a creative class and the promise, but how those things fit together. So I live right now in Prairie Village, Kansas, in the Kansas City metro area, where I've lived most of the time since I've been away from SIU. And we're known for a variety of things. It's, it's a nice little community inside a, inside a bigger city. One of the things particularly in Prairie Village we're known for, which I find the SIU campus may be known for the same thing, because you all have got some fairly friendly squirrels I discovered yesterday. They, they're actually open to having their pictures taken and posing over by the student center. But this is one of the squirrels in my neighborhood, and, and we have a lot of squirrels. And, and I write a daily blog on strategy and creativity and innovation, so I figure these squirrels are living in my neighborhood. They're probably blog readers. They're probably fairly creative, and, and you know, this is something that may be of interest. I, I know one other thing that's of interest to these squirrels is eating pumpkins. They love to eat pumpkins. So I figured I'd put these two things together a couple years ago. We had this Halloween carving time in October, and uh, we had three pumpkins. So I carved the first pumpkin, and I did this little design, which I thought was pretty nice, little skeleton and cat, and you know, very happy with that. Second pumpkin I carved into, and it was rotten. I was like, okay, well, I can't do anything with that. And the third pumpkin we had was just beautiful, perfect pumpkin that our neighbor had given us. But quite honestly, by that time, I was bored with carving pumpkins. I thought, you know what? I'm gonna put this pumpkin out on the front porch, and I'm gonna let the squirrels take advantage of it. Because again, blog readers, creative, I wanna see what type of art that my squirrels are able to come up with. So I put it out there, and it was probably, I don't know, a week later. Uh, not too much had happened with theirs, a little bit. Mine, they destroyed the first night it was out there. I mean, they just ripped into it, the faces were gone, and it was a mess. But my wife and I were actually going to church one Sunday, and I looked down at the pumpkin that I'd put out for the squirrels, and, and that was it. And I thought, look at how pathetic, really, is, you know, I put this out here for these guys to be creative and do some art, and that is the best they could do. And 
I just didn't get it. I didn't get where they were going with this, and I immediately thought, I must have the worst squirrels in the world. I don't have creative squirrels in my neighborhood. But when you write a blog post every day, that's an opportunity for a blog post. So I thought, I'll come home this afternoon, I'll take some photos, and this will be a blog post about how funny it is the creative guy has the most uncreative, dumb, stupid squirrels in the world. So I come home that afternoon, I start to move the pumpkin around. And as I did that, I started to see something different. As I, as I shifted it and looked around, I realized the pumpkin saw the squirrel in a way very differently than I did. You know, we all think about it, the stem is on top and you carve a face, but I realized with our squirrels, for them, the stem was the nose. And they started to carve, do you see the face in there? Who sees the face? Eh, maybe this will help you. Okay, now watch. This is usually an ooh and ah moment. <laughs> okay, we'll play that again for, for the, the, the still non-believers in the audience. The scream munches the scream. Amazing. And you know what the most amazing part of it is? Just shortly after that, the scream sold for $119 million. Now think about it. Here with my business perspective and what I thought was my pseudo-creative perspective, I just didn't get what my squirrels were thinking about. I didn't see their perspective. But I needed to look at things in a different way. That's a big part of a creative community. It's not just, well, let's attract creatives here. Let's attract artists and musicians and we've got it. It's to understand what are their perspectives. But for the creatives are here, the flip of that is, Munch didn't get $119 million for that painting. It was the people later on and the business people who made it come together. So this idea of appreciating perspectives in a creative economy, it really is each part of the community starting to see both sides and appreciating those different perspectives. And again, that's, that's a lesson we've seen play out in Kansas City, that there are new faces coming into town, people from new places, and understanding how do all of us work together to create this different kind of economy, you know, in part built around this gigabit te technology. Second one I want to talk about is cultivating diverse ideas. So if you, if you start to attract a more diverse group of people, how do you get them to work together? And, and the thing I want to talk about here is, so Google Fiber, Who's familiar with Google Fiber has heard that, that concept before? So Google a few years ago announced that we're going to start and basically pick a first community to put ultra high speed fast internet. So essentially a gigabit or in, in more layman's terms, internet that's typically about 100 times faster than any of us might have at our home right now. They did a, a national search and I think 1,100 or 1,200 communities you know, were raising a hand and saying, we want that, here's why we should have that. And they happen to pick Kansas City, Kansas, and then right after that, Kansas City, Missouri. So this is a very exciting time in 2011. And early on, probably just a, a couple months after this had happened, an organization that I'm involved with there called the Social Media Club of Kansas City held an event out at the T-Bones, uh, the minor league baseball park. So it was billed as, come to hear the, the leaders of Kansas City, Kansas, and Kansas City, Missouri, talk about Google Fiber and what this means. And in the course of this, I mean, we're standing beyond the park, out in the outfield in sort of a dusty hospitality area. The officials are talking, and one of them says, you know, Google Fiber didn't come with an instruction manual. It's gonna be organizations in the community, organizations like Social Media Club of Kansas City that are going to need to help us understand what this means because there's no one right way or one perfect way or one less or more risky way that this starts to play out. And I, I heard that statement and immediately the wheel started turning in my mind and thinking about to do that successfully, if this organization, which typically got together for breakfast and people would brainstorm and maybe write a few things on a piece of paper and nothing would ever happen with it, if that was going to, to meet that objective, that expectation, that challenge that had been placed in front of us, we were gonna to need to reach out to a variety of different people. And, and this is where we started to pull some of what I'd learned from a corporate side in that there are basically three different perspectives you need to look at and manage for if you want the best thinking and the best looking ahead. What's, what's the vision for a community? And one is people with direct experience, whether that's business people or technologists, you know, any type of situation that's going to vary, but who are people who have very direct experience in this topic that we're looking at? 
The second is people who have a functional expertise. Uh, they may be community activists. They may be social scientists. The, the, it's not right at the heart of the issue, but it's very much related and we have to be successful. And the third is people with creative energy who will just look at problems and solutions in a very different way. And if you have those three groups together, you get incredible thinking. But the challenge is a lot of times those groups want to kill each other. I mean, business people don't, yeah, and creatives, yeah, because they all think differently. And that's sort of what, where we developed what we do to help them all start to work together. So I knew we'd have to have those three groups. And, and additionally, we'd have to have different types of voices. It couldn't just be the familiar voices. And, and here's the people who always show up. And here's the noted names and leaders of the community. And I could rattle off names that may not mean anything here. But in Kansas City, you'd go, oh, the, those are the leaders. That's, that's the establishment. We would also need challenger voices as well. People who said, well, you know what? I've seen the status quo, and I think we need to do it different ways. And emerging voices, new voices who hadn't ever even been part of the conversation before. A lot of times the challenger voices are familiar ones. They're just sort of pain in the rear familiar ones. But who would be these new emerging voices? So all of this is rattling around in my head, thinking about what could we do, what could we do? And in 45 seconds later, I tweeted the then president of Social Media Club, and I said, that's it. We're in to do something different, to approach this in a different way, and create a community event in and around Google coming into town that can help answer that challenge of what does this mean for the future. And it wasn't all just you know, rah, rah, hey, this is great. Uh, I learned an important lesson that evening. So we did a report out that night of a number of the ideas and concepts that came out. And learned the impact of a challenger voice right off. This is Bill Mullins. I dare say probably every community has their Bill Mullins or multiple Bill Mullins. Bill Mullins is a nuclear scientist. He's a brilliant man. I actually exchanged emails with, with Bill this morning on a topic. But Bill got up at this public forum in front of everybody and said, well, has anybody looked about the bad aspects of Google coming into town? And what are the unintended consequences? And this may be the worst thing that ever happened to us. Now, in a typical setting, in a big meeting with a bunch of people and TV cameras, you go, oh my gosh, the person is up who doesn't like this idea. How do we get them off? And I went up to Bill afterwards. I said, you know what? I don't understand exactly what you're talking about. Because after way, Bill is a nuclear scientist. So I just thinks about things in a very deep level. Somebody get the phone. No, anyway. I said, I don't. I don't have time to understand all these things, but I said, would you put together a white paper for us on what you think is wrong and what you think is problematic? He was like, yeah, I guess I would. We actually included that white paper in the final report, because it's like, we want to hear those other voices, because that's part of what is making this stronger. So out of this day-long session, we came out with a 120-page report of 60-some concepts and more than 200 ideas. This thing has ultimately been downloaded and, interestingly, more countries than states, like 37 countries and people in 36 states to look at it. And we basically put it out to the world and said, this is what we saw for Kansas City. There may be some answers for your community here. It's not all these answers. It may be some of these answers. But really think about this as a toolkit. And it's, it's still out there, brainzooming.com backslash Google Fiber KC, you can go out and download this report. Again, it's not an answer, it's not a panacea, but it's another part of the mix, another ingredient. So that's really about how you cultivate and work with those different ideas. But then importantly, how do you set up collaboration and get that going on an ongoing basis? And this is something that, again, we've tried to bring to the table from the lessons that we've learned over time about how you get larger and larger groups for issues where you need a very large group to collaborate and move toward an end product as opposed to, it was an interesting conversation. We had a lot of people show up and, and everybody walked away. This is actually a quote from an issue in Kansas City. We were looking at a, not, we community-wide, doing a study on a new airport a couple years ago. And the mayor came out and said, you know, this needs to be very collaborative. We need to have a lot of voices. Everybody needs to have their, their sense heard. You have the task force person who says, we're going to have an open process. Probably those things are said in every community when they look at a big infrastructure project and we're going to bring folks together. It's going to be open and we're going to hear everybody. But the challenge is the first answer to that is often to do the typical kind of town hall meeting where the task force they sit at the front of the room. We have a situation like this. And one person gets up at a time, and they talk. And we capture all that. And it's really, 
not to, not to say you don't want to do that. If you've got somebody who's really expert, yeah, you may want to have one voice or, or a few sets of voices talking to the group and educating. But when you're looking at community visioning, pretty much everybody's got a valid and important perspective. And something like that becomes very inefficient. We never could have done a 120-page report with that depth in a day if we'd had a town hall meeting and had eight hours of one person at a time coming up. So we tend to take a different approach that if, if the key to understanding an uncertain future is a lot of perspectives and multiple scenarios and playing through options, there's got to be a more efficient way to do it. You can't do it in the typical town hall meeting. So we tend to look at that of let's bring 100 or a couple of hundred people together, but instead of one talking and 199 listening, how do we break it up into small groups and get twos and threes and fours and fives and sixes talking together and collaborating because now you can use the power of math to really take advantage of a lot more ideas in a lot more rapid kind of fashion. But having done this, and I was talking to somebody earlier that we put one of these together in two weeks and I'll give you a little bit of the scenario of that. It doesn't just happen. You don't just invite 200 people and they show up and that type of productive conversation happens, particularly with diverse perspectives. And that's where you put structure into place that can help facilitate that and make that happen across creatives, non-creatives, business, for-profit, government, non-profit, to bring those voices together. You know, David mentioned in, in Shiloh's report addresses uh, digital divide. This idea that, well, what percent of the population doesn't have access to the internet? And increasingly, and maybe already, that isn't a luxury to have the internet. You know, think about how many jobs. It's an online application, and now I can't get to the internet, or I don't have digital skills. I'm already economically disadvantaged, and now it's just going to get worse. And I think Kansas City, the numbers are probably on par. I think Shiloh's report said it was about 18% across the two counties. Kansas City, it's 17%. And you may look at that and go, well, that's not that bad. I mean, that seems pretty manageable. But if you look under those numbers, probably in any community, there's wide disparities in that access to the internet based on uh, socioeconomic factors, income, just a whole variety of things. You can't just take that top line number. So there was a group in Kansas City looking at digital literacy and digital inclusion, and they had convened this meeting for October 18th last year, invite the community, have 14 or 15 educational presentations. And a few weeks out from that, they said, you know what, if we do that, we're just going to have a bunch of presentations and we're not going to have anything actionable. So really two weeks out, I had the first meeting with them October 4th, it was two Fridays before, we sat down and said, well, what could we do differently? We already have these 14 or 15 presentations scheduled, what can we do? And we created a set of, of basically four questions and we had divided these, these tracks into best practices and then basically tools and put together four questions that they could talk about for about 10 or 15 minutes inside these 75 minute presentations. And, and these questions are what we call strategic detours. We don't ask the typical questions that everybody knows the answer to. We ask the question in a little bit different way because then people have to think about it. So it wasn't what do you like or dislike about the internet or what do you think will happen or not happen. We ask questions about well who isn't in the conversation right now that should be. Or what's a challenge that you don't hear being talked about that somebody needs to start to pay attention to. So from this, we had hundreds of these responses happening across these 14 and 15 uh, presentations during the day, all looking at different aspects of digital inclusion. And because we knew you can't just talk about the digital divide, you need to experience it, we actually asked 17% of the people coming that day to surrender their smartphones, their laptops, anything that had digital connectivity. And they did that, and we gave them, you can see the little t-shirts, you'll see it more in a, in a subsequent slide, it says, I'm in the divide. This was a group, Literacy Kansas City, one of the organizations that's working on adult literacy and, and digital literacy and just fundamental reading literacy in Kansas City. They organized a breakout, and they, they divided the group into the people who had digital access and the non-digital people, and started their session with a quiz, with very difficult questions. And the digital people started going to Google, and they're finding answers, and they're working through. The digital divide people are going, we don't know who the third queen of England was. What are we going to do? So they ran over with, guess what? 
a laptop. Here's, here's technology. Here's technology. He gave it to him. The laptop wouldn't connect correctly to the Wi-Fi in the library. So we'd given them technology, but it still wasn't the issue. There was more to it than that. And it was interesting because we, we had these people talk later about that experience and how they felt about it. And it was, a, it was a really important part of creating that experience. So we went from a day where a couple hundred people were going to show up at the library and hear presentations to a way that we could actually give them a means to talk about and share what happened and turn the communication of the experience and the knowledge and the learning into something that was crowd friendly and something that we've come to think about as toolkits. That's what we create out of these events, our, our toolkits. And I, I urge you within Carbondale and Southern Illinois to think about the same kind of thing as well. It's not, we put this together and it's, this is us. It's we put this together and now we're putting it out there because other people with other ideas and other perspectives are going to grow even more incredible things than we maybe imagined right away. One of the ways we do that is with storytelling. So we invited these people who were in the digital divide to, to get up and share their stories at the end of the afternoon of, of how they felt. They felt disenfranchised. They felt uncomfortable. They felt like they weren't as smart as everybody else because I don't know where to go to get an answer to a question or I can't go connect with somebody. So part of it's storytelling. We took all the responses that people had to this digital inclusion event and actually put together a summary report. I think the, the summary, we had nine key themes that came out, not from the leadership in solving digital inclusion, but from the community and put all their comments in behind that. And it was interesting because they identified things that nobody else was thinking about. So think about it. If you're trying to cross the digital divide, it doesn't really help to put up a web page and say, hey, if you can't get to the internet, click on this button and we'll solve that. How do you reach them? And they said, you know what? The people that we're trying to reach are in churches. There wasn't one faith-based leader that was involved with digital inclusion. There was a huge gap. The leadership of the organization, of the digital inclusion effort, social agencies, civic agencies, all doing really great work. But one of the things the community said was, where is the business community? Who's going to hire these newly digitally literate people? Who needs them for customer service jobs and technology jobs and other jobs where they have to have these skills? It was a great point because when you have an economic motive for getting people digitally literate, it's very different than the social motivation. They're both important, but they're different. So it started to suggest things there. They said, you know what? We learned about all these events that are, are all these resources that are out in the community, and nobody's put this together. Why don't we know about these things? So it became an awareness building piece to it as well. And maybe more importantly, and, and something that may be valuable to think about, and maybe you've come across these same areas already, is the idea that it isn't all technology. Again, it's social barriers. It's fear of, yeah, my kid has a laptop at school, but I don't want him to bring that laptop home because I'm afraid for their safety as they're carrying this computer home from the bus and what's going to happen to them. Or it's, you know what, that's great that they have a, a place at the library or a place at this school for internet, but I can't get there because the bus line doesn't go there. And it really helped bring home, it's not just technology, it's all these other issues. And, and we did a press event this morning. People were asking about you know, other applications and things that came up. I thought one of the brilliant ideas, and just so simple, but I'm not sure anybody else had been thinking about it. They said, you know what? If we have this fiber in the school, they need that during the day. At night, we need it in the apartment buildings and the homes surrounding the school. Why don't we set up a network so at night we're able to tap into that around there? And these students who are having this access during the day can come home and watch lectures or watch instruction as well. Brilliant idea, but again, it didn't come from the leadership, it came from the community. So it really is about how do you capture all those perspectives and start to do things. You know, sometimes it's a fully fledged concept. So here was one of the concepts, creating a cultural cash time capsule. And I'll talk a little bit about that later, but this was one of the ideas that came out of the first gigabit city. Uh, and I always tell people, when there's an ooh or an ah or laughter in a room, that's when you know you're onto an idea that's really special. Because people are either so in awe that there's just this 
or they laugh because it's so challenging and uncomfortable. They resolve that tension with laughter. This is one of the ones as it was shared that night, there was just an ooh of, oh my gosh, that's big. That's the kind of thing that makes us different. And again, this idea of not every idea that's out there is all the same. You know, sometimes you share those results, sometimes you need to ask for resources. It's the idea that anything anybody's bringing to the table with a very honest perspective about what's going on and opportunity is something that you need to work with. One of the things we did uh, was put together a series of global telepresences. So through Dave Sandel, who happens to be here, worked with him and a variety of other folks in Kansas City to bring in experts from around the world. So they didn't have to be in Kansas City but to get these dialogues going. And one of the questions from somebody in Barcelona, Joseph Piquet, or Joseph Piquet, which has haunted me since he said it, I, I think it's the best thing I've heard out of all this work that we've done over the last few years is, when everything is in the cloud, what does place mean? Now think about that. When everything's in the cloud, what does place mean? Because as we think about place, place is where we originate from or reside. It's where we make things and buy things, or where services are performed. It's, it's where things are consumed. It's, it's where we're entertained. And if now that doesn't always have to be, it's right there to have a very real presence of it, it's in the cloud, you can start to reimagine a place in a very dramatic way. You heard some of that in the video. And I think among all the great work that's happening in Carbondale and is happening in Southern Illinois, I think maybe, and I, my hope is that you walk away with that question today, that when everything is in the cloud, what does Carbondale mean? We talked about that this morning. It's, it's not necessarily everything that's physically here and all the resources that we have or we can attract and we're, you know, yeah, we're off a highway and how do we get people here is, how do we create a hub of connectivity that the, the, the first and easiest and best place to get that connectivity is to be in Carbondale? So that's sort of my challenge question for the day. And I don't expect anybody to have an answer, but, but to, to add that question to the mix and think about, if we're looking at a creative place, if it's in the cloud, what does that start to look like for us? For those who couldn't see the slides and would also like a case study of some of the things we talked about, at info.brainzooming.com backslash, and this is the, the backslash includes the same Twitter hashtag, which I forgot to mention the Twitter hashtag at the start. I should have done that. But Carbondale Gigabit. You can go get a download of these slides, some of the case studies and, and information. But importantly, the time we've got here left, I want to open up and see what things do you want to talk about? Are there, are there topics, questions, information you want to share that you know, I do want to take advantage of. I've got 150 people in a room. They need to hear what I'm thinking, so. Thank you, thank you. And Mike, thank you very much for coming back to Southern Illinois. Thank we're, you. We're glad to have you here. Thank you to the sponsors who brought you here. Uh, the timing of this is perfect for us. My name is Stephen Mitchell. I'm with Connect SI. And I'm lucky enough to be on a team uh, that has written for and received a $50,000 planning grant for the city of Carbondale to revitalize downtown. As a matter of fact, uh, Megan, Travis, uh, they're both Megan Cole with uh, down, uh, Carbondale Main Street, Travis with the city of Carbondale. Um, our goal is to put together a plan that help revitalize downtown. Uh, we want to take advantage of the great work that was done by the uh, Downtown Advisory Committee and the Downtown Master Plan. But we also want to leverage the uh, gigabit. There's a gigabit network that some people may not be aware of that runs east and west across the uh, main thoroughfare, Route 13 in, in Carbondale. We want to leverage that, bring those capabilities to downtown, and we want to um, create opportunities for entrepreneurs, for business enhancement, and those kinds of things in the downtown area. So, Mike, the question I have for you is, right now we're in the middle of this process. We're in the middle of the writing the grant. Uh, our hope is to make the next level, which is a $100,000 implementation. There's only going to be eight chosen. There are 50 chosen to uh, do what we're doing right now. There will be eight chosen to implement. Um, as we develop this plan, do you have a suggestion on how we should reach out to the community? Because community input is going to be very important. Community engagement aspects going to be very important to what we're going to do. Do you have a suggestion uh, about uh, who we should reach out to and how we should reach out to them? Yeah, I mean, and a lot of it is sort of the, the infrastructure to do it is, is in here. It's these kind of things. I think the first and maybe most important question to ask is, who else do you think should be involved? 
because it, it's challenging to think that even a diverse team of eight or 10 or 15 people is going to know all the voices and all the different parts of the community that's involved. So I, I would, on a first pass, send everybody out with that question of who else do you think, whether they are or not right now, don't, don't worry about having to know whether they are or not, who else should be a part of this conversation? And, and give people a little bit of that structure so they've got a frame of reference to think about, oh yeah, I know this person or that person, or I've seen them and they're doing really interesting things. I don't even understand exactly what they're doing, but they should be a part of it. Use the community to find out what that bigger community is would be my, uh, would be my first advice. Other questions? Steve was brave enough to step up. Um, yeah, I was on the downtown committee, but I would think uh, maybe bringing in something that shows the connection, communication. Um, I, like, I Skype with my mom when I travel out of the country. Like, it lags when you use low-grade internet and stuff. Like, if you can show the ability to communicate and connect, I mean, that's a huge feature that affects everyone, I feel like, not just entrepreneurs, um, artistic minds. So. I, I really uh, think you could bring that in. And it's a great point. It was one of the things we were talking about this morning is uh, one of the uses in Kansas City, and again, that has need and application all over, is telemedicine. So if you've got a pocket of, of medical expertise, but you've got people in rural areas that don't have access to that, or it's 100 miles or 120 miles away and someone's physical condition or their mobility precludes them from getting to that doctor. The, the opportunity of telemedicine, which has been around a long time. I mean, I remember my first job looking at telemedicine with the, the advent of PCs at the time. At that point, it was just why well, I could see somebody and talk to them, and then you know, maybe it's in real time. It's, it's, you know. What's incredible now is you can get access to x-rays and diagnostic things that can actually happen in real time because of this, the, the, the width of the connection. You can get that much information through, that much data. Maybe even manipulate instruments, medical instruments through this. So yeah, absolutely. You know, the, the easy answer, and a lot of people talk about, well, I could do video stuff or I could do gaming stuff, but it's to start to look at what are those next levels of how does this apply and start changing people's lives, their health, their economics, culture, everything else. So it's, it's a great example. Other questions? I know to the southwest or southeast of here, a lot of the, um, the facilities, medical facilities are being closed down because of, of cost increases right. and, and non-compensation or compensation that isn't adequate to cover their costs. Um, the idea of integrating SIU medical, SIH medical, city of Carbondale, and creating a hub that may, I've never heard of it being done before, but yeah. just doing just what you were talking about, I think would be tremendous. It would be powerful. Yeah, and I did rent to a, I'm a landlord, and I rented to a man who came in here to start um, Frontier. He was an electrical engineer. He had worked for GTE his whole life. He, I sat down with him when the, the building was all closed and had a really interesting conversation and what's coming, you cannot believe, because I asked him what was available, how, how many gigabytes could you, I told him I'd like a gigabyte a second at my house, and he says, is that possible? He says, yes. And I said, well, what's possible? He says, it's unlimited. And I says, well, how's that possible? They already have the technology to um, assign you a color and there's more colors in the world than there are people. Right. So you can have, this is, this is coming, and that's, uh, I'd love to see it happen. Well, and I think a really interesting, and we talked about this in some of the, the interviews, I think it's a really interesting time, because right now in, in that creative, you know, who's the top creative city sort of plays this out of, when not everybody has this, when not every city has it, you now can start to see some advantage of, well, if we've got this capability and this connectivity, that makes us more attractive than other places that people may locate businesses or may decide to live or may do a whole variety of other things. As more and more cities put this in place over five and 10 and 15 and 20 years, that advantage will start to go away and it will become a base expectation. So for the laggards of this, they're gonna wind up doing it eventually 
but you're not gonna get that hit of, of the attractiveness and the newness of it. And I think that's one of the things nationally to think about. You've got a lot of countries around the world who are leagues ahead of this in this. So where nationally do we sit and how do we take best advantage of it? But yeah, it's a great, great example. Yeah. Listen to that because that would be, I think that would put a good Yeah. In, in a great example of not just an intra look of, well, how do we make this for Carbondale or Southern Illinois, but how are we reaching out and using what we have to benefit other people? I think it was Dale, Dale Carnegie or Norman Vince Peale. You know, that, that's it's a good business secret. I don't think that one's gone away in the internet age. Other questions? We've got one right here. Oh. Go ahead, Mr. Harness. <laughs> after, after you. Thank you, Mike. Ted yeah. Gutierrez from the Small Business Development Center at SIU. Um, so I can get a better time frame of this whole project from when Kansas City and Kansas City were announced or chosen to be gigabit cities. Where are you now in the process of that? And do you have an update as to um, what plans have actually uh, been identified in the path that's going to be taken. Can you give us an update on that? Yeah, and I don't know that there's any one good soundbite kind of sentence that explains it. I mean, we were talking this morning, interestingly enough, so four years in of laying fiber, Google hasn't gotten to every place even in Kansas City yet. And again, we, we talked about Google Fiber, but there's other internet service providers. There's, there's a whole variety of models to do this. This just happens to be the frame of reference for a lot of this work. So I live in a Prairie Village, which I talked about. Prairie Village has a contract with Google. Uh, they were checking some polls recently, and I saw the sign the other day that says we're starting to dig on stuff. But this is four years in. So it's not like there's any one solution is going to get to everything. I think the thing that we've seen in Kansas City, in, in you know, when people say, well, what are the impacts? The first one, which actually isn't an app, and it isn't a tool, and it isn't online, but is profoundly dramatic, is political. Kansas City, Kansas, and Kansas City, Missouri came together to work on this. And you didn't, you know, we're different states. Slave state, free state. That line is hundreds of years of, they're different than us over here. Mayor Sly James in Kansas City and Joe Reardon, who at the time was the mayor of Wyandotte County or Kansas City, Kansas, those guys were attached at the hip. When you saw one, you saw the other one. And now there's a new mayor in, in Kansas City, Kansas, and the same kind of deal. That we actually were now talking across the state line, as, as we talked about in here, and thinking about if I win and you lose, we both lost. We're not both winning. So th that was a huge impact. We've seen entrepreneurial impacts, a lot of little startup nests that are tied into fiber, where they're just bringing, again, interesting people with business ideas together to sort of hit and collaborate and, and do whatever. We've seen some of the telemedicine, um, the, the digital literacy things. I mean, I, in our interest in where we play, we don't sit in the middle of it, so I don't look at it day by day, but those are some of the things. And, and I'll, I have one more story I'll wrap up with after we're done with the Q&A that sort of gets to that point of, you're never gonna know exactly all the ways, but you get it out there in place and start to see what happens, and if, if that addresses the, at least starts to. Yeah. I had a very low, ex somebody you know, from the chamber told me, just don't say bad things about the chamber, and I'd be okay. So that, that's the next level of a higher standard. I got all right, over here. What has been the biggest take as far as the Gigabyte City in Kansas City as far as bringing in and fostering entrepreneurship and innovation out of this project? And most importantly, what has it done to bring in new business ideas and technology to Kansas City? And, and again, I'm going to stand with a list of, oh, is this person, this person, this person. I think some of the things we talked about this morning, you've got the Kauffman Foundation, which is based in Kansas City. Uh, came out of Ewan Kaufman, who started a drug company, so very entrepreneurially focused, not only locally but nationally. They've continued to reach out and create these little pods of entrepreneurs, and in every, every week conversations of bringing together a couple of people with business ideas and other folks in the community to just start them interacting. We've seen some of these tech startup areas. Uh, as part of the Gigabit City Summit that, that Steve referenced that, that we uh, sponsored in January, we took people to the Kansas City Startup Village. It was basically built around the first house 
that got Google Fiber. And th this offer has been to homes, not to businesses. The first entree was to homes. And this guy realizing, I happen to be in a particular zoning area where I could have multiple businesses in here. And started to invite other people, as long as I think there was a residential component to give other businesses. And this started to expand out. So completely away from the corporate organizational infrastructure, here's Kansas City Startup Village, where you can go, they've got their flag planted, and in a, in a sort of beleaguered area, starts to bring home prices up, brings youth into that, and in these new ideas. And I, as you go to meetings, you will see people stand up and say, I was in California, and I heard about this, and I wanted to be a part of it. So I picked up roots and came to Kansas City. And it, I mean, it's, it's an interesting thing as someone who's very rooted, and I've been in the same house for 25 years to imagine, wow, you could be at a time in life where, oh, there's cool internet over there, let's go over there. But that's the kind of things that are happening. That's, a, that's an early mover's advantage. And again, Kansas City was very blessed to have Google sort of offer this up as opposed to, you know, it's, it's maybe one of the challenges too, is we, we didn't have to do the things that Carbondale is doing right now of, we've got to figure out a model. You know, is this a utility? How do we do this municipally? Is it, is it in a business corridor? So some of that groundwork that you will see benefits from, we actually didn't do or didn't have to do. So I think, you know, it was great to get Google Fiber, but I think the model that you're looking at in Carbondale and Southern Illinois, there's tremendous advantages too that will start to pay dividends over a longer period of time. You have one more question, then we'll, or we'll just wrap, so. Uh, yeah, I think Shiloh, you, you're going to send this out to people, or it's out on the so paulsimoninstitute.siu.edu gigab backslash gigabit opportunity to sort of give some feedback. And again, some of the very oh, so it's on a blue card. Some of the very same questions that we used at this digital inclusion thing. I was working with with Shiloh and David and Delio to say, how can we put some of these questions out to you and take advantage of your perspectives, your expertise, and some of the things that you're thinking about. This is, and I wrote down the artist's name because I should know this, Alan Howes. This is an art installation at the Marriott Oakbrook up in Chicago. And I did a, a boot camp for a transportation group there last year. And I walked down the hall and saw this. And it's, it's a much bigger installation. But you know, you always hear the story about the goose that laid the golden egg. And visually, I just always thought about, well, it'll be a gold egg. A bunch of white eggs, and there'll be a gold egg, and you'll know that's the very special egg. And I saw this installation of all these eggs, and they're all white outside, and the gold is inside. And I thought, how interesting. And, and doesn't that really change everything of what incredible opportunities might we walk past all the time? And one of the questions I get more than anything, and hints of it here today is, well, what's the ROI on this? And where's the payback going to be? And, and what are all the things that are going to happen first? What's, what's the first use going to be? And it sounds like sort of a wishy-washy answer, but a lot of times you just don't know the answer to that question until you get it in place. An example here, it's a, it's a little bit akin to the, uh, to the squirrel story of sort of my own struggles of business person creative, business person and creative. Before we did this, the, the first gigabit session that I showed the video of, we use these big posters. You may have seen some of them in the video. So three by four foot posters, get them done at you know, an office supply, it happened to be FedEx office. And I was there the Saturday before doing all these posters, spending hundreds of dollars with FedEx. And they were printing out, and then I was going to need to organize them. And across the way, I saw this woman who was making CD covers. She had the entire table that I needed to sort my posters with her little CD covers. And I was already chafing. I mean, it was chomping at the bit of like, I'm spending hundreds of dollars here, and she's taking up all the space I need. Worse than just her sp taking up the space, she talked to everybody. So that slowed her down as well. So she was talking to this young man, and I was just under my fuming. I was catching snippets of the conversation, and I heard something about she's English, she's an actress, and yes, it's an unusual name. And I'm thinking, English, actress, it's an unusual, he may have said two names. Now I knew that the photographer who had stepped up to volunteer to take the photos for this Gigabit City event was Alex, 
Bonham Carter, Helena Bonham Carter. I turned around and looked at him and said, you're going to be taking pictures at the Gigabit City event, aren't you? He's like, yes, how did you know that? He's like, because, two names, English actress, very unusual. I could put it together, your last name is Bonham Carter. That led to, I was now being talked to by this woman who was doing all the CD covers. I looked at the CD cover and noticed it was for the funeral of someone that I went to daily mass with for probably 10 years who had passed away about two months before. And I knew this, this man had, I think, five daughters. I said, are you one of Dick's daughters? He said, no, but they're, one of his daughters is a dear friend of mine, and I've got the DVD of his funeral mass, and I'm making those. And I was like, now, isn't that interesting? These two people, one happens to be you know, our photographer, who I never would have known if she hadn't been talking. I wouldn't have been able to make that connection and talk to him about the event. And then here's this person who knows somebody that, you know, interestingly, I never talked to the guy. He just sat across, you know, how you can be in church. You never talk to somebody, but they're over there. So she started talking. said, well, what are you doing? I'm trying to get out of here so I can get ready. That's what I'm trying to do. <laughs> so I started talking to her about it and explaining it. She's like, that's fascinating. She said, I'm so tapped into what's going on with this and the urban core and what are we doing. She said, can I come? And you know, I showed you the triangle before. I said, we've spent weeks organizing every single group and every single person that was invited. And everybody's in exactly their same right spot that they're supposed to be in. I was like, sure, just show up. And I don't care what group you go to, just go to it. By this point, I was sort of starting to see, Mike, there's a bigger path here you need to be paying attention to. So she was in the video. Her name's Paula Holmquist. So I talked about the digital time capsule. This idea was put this capability in place in the big uh, events and landmarks around Kansas City so that when you go there, you can videotape your day or, or get a capture of your day and your experience catalog these, and generations later, when somebody goes to the World War I Memorial in Kansas City, I can see what my great-great-grandfather was thinking about that day, and what was his experience. Someone I may not have ever even known personally, and I can see it like he was there. It's a huge idea. As I said, it was just sort of that, wow, of anything else, this is it. So Paula was in the audience that night, and she heard that idea. This was in November 2011. Veterans Day was coming up. For Veterans Day, the, the Saturday either before or after, Paula took her dad, who was a Korean War veteran, to the World War I Memorial and the Korean Memorial in Kansas City and videoed him telling stories about the war. And one of them was a Vietnam veteran who was there. And he was, they were going back and forth about being in the Navy and all this. She got all this on video, probably 15 minutes of these stories that she'd never had before with her dad. Two weeks later, her father passed away. This was the video that she had. And it all came from this one idea and this one concept at this event. And that's why I told people, I said, I could never have predicted that was going to happen. I don't know that there's a monetary ROI on it. But that kind of connection and that kind of impact, when you bring creative people together with heart and passion and a, and a willingness to connect with one another, that's what profoundly shapes communities and people and lives. And that's what this capability in southern Illinois, in Carbondale, Illinois, I don't know what it's going to be, but it's the kind of thing it can do. Thank you all so much for making my return to Carbondale so nice. Thank you.